Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Claire Hoskins. I'm one of the radiology consultants at uh, BMI Shirley Oaks Hospital and also Croydon University Hospital. I've been there since uh, 1992. It's great to see you all here today. Of course, I know many of your faces. My brief is to look at the role of abdominal ultrasound. We do 240,000 investigations at Croydon University Hospital a year now, and abdominal ultrasound is very much our bread and butter. Uh, basically, uh, commonest indication is right upper quadrant pain. We're looking at gallstones, yes or no, and if there are, what are their complications? Uh, it's also an excellent basic tool for looking at the renal tract, hydronephrosis, stones, cysts, other disorders. Good at vascular, uh, particularly aorta, portal vein, other vessels. Uh, very good for assessing abdominal masses, whether they are there or not, and if they are, what they're due to. Uh, and also, it's got an increasing role in casualty on a fast scan basis, various operators trained uh, looking for fluid and other causes. Uh, a good screening tool for sepsis. Uh, has a role in acute appendicitis, although CT is a, a, a competitor there. Uh, gyne pathology, of course. Uh, hernias, uh, it does guide interventional procedures. It's particularly good for people uh, with lean body habitus, not a lot of fat, uh, particularly good for children as well. Uh, I'm sure many of you of my generation will remember these huge ultrasound machines. Well, now, quite honestly, you can get a wonderful images, plenty of functionality, Doppler, color Doppler, power Doppler, you name it, uh, and the machines the size of just a laptop, really. Uh, in fact, I was in ITU last week and they handed me a portable machine and it looked like one of those little pads that my adolescent children like, you know, iPads. It really is as small as that, attached to a computer and a probe. So uh, they're getting smaller and smaller and therefore they can be taken anywhere, uh, particularly the patient's bedside. Uh, here's a standard view of the uh, abdomen uh, in a nice lean patient with not a lot of gas in the way. Uh, and you can see the pancreas here, the splenic vein, the portal venous confluence going on to the, pan going on to the portal vein. Uh, you can have a look at the liver, the aorta, the superior mesenteric artery, uh, the spine. Uh, and this is the sort of appearance. Basically, it puts high-frequency sound into the patient's tissues. It then collects back the echoes that the patient's organs send it. It analyzes them in terms of echo strength and position of echo, and then in real time, multiple times per second, refresh rate, it provides you with a real time picture of the abdominal organs. It doesn't go through bone and it doesn't go through gas, so you would expect it to be good at the soft tissue abdominal organs and the fluid filled spaces in the abdomen, gallbladder bladder and so on, but you wouldn't expect it to be good at looking for bowel gas or bone because it doesn't go through those areas. In fact, bowel gas is the enemy of ultrasound because it often obscures stuff that is behind it. Uh, gallbladder preeminently, of course. Uh, here's a picture of a normal gallbladder. Note we can assess the wall size. Uh, ultrasound, when it goes through fluid, doesn't send back any echoes, uh, so it appears black and that's normal bile in the gallbladder. The machine will gradually increase the brightness of the picture to compensate for the fact that the ultrasound beam is being absorbed by the tissues as it goes through. But if it goes through water, then it's not being absorbed by the tissues. The, the machine doesn't know that, so you'll get increased bright up behind. That's known as posterior acoustic enhancement. Basically tells you there's water or substance that isn't sending back much echoes. So here's bile, which is effectively water, and here's a nice normal thickness gallbladder wall. When the ultrasound hits something hard, such as a rib or a stone, it refracts the beam, it bounces back, and you get a shadow behind it in much the same way as I if I stood in front of a light, I would cast a shadow, and that's because the beam can't get through this stone. There's the posterior acoustic shadow, uh, which gives away... Uh, the presence of the gallstone. This is a nice big gallstone, so it's very easy to see. Normal bile in the gallbladder, normal uh, gallbladder thickness wall. Uh, here's another gallbladder. Uh, this time, no stones in it, 
but there's a very thick and irregular wall. We've put the power on. You can do this color power just at the press of a button, and you can see it's a very hyperemic wall, very irregular. Uh, this is a grossly thickened gallbladder wall. This is cholecystitis. Usually, of course, it's calculus cholecystitis, but if there aren't any gallstones, uh, then it's going to be acalculus cholecystitis. We pick up many liver masses on ultrasound. We often don't want to because, of course, a lot of liver masses are normal incidental findings. About 8% of the population, I think, have hemangiomata. Uh, often ultrasound will be used to pick it up. Is it single? Is it multiple? Is it echogenic or not? Here's a mass in the left lobe of liver at this point, aorta, IVC, left lobe of liver. We usually go on to characterization with CT and MR. That allows us to give contrast so we can see the perfusion. There are some units which will use contrast in ultrasound. They're microbubbles, um, but not the majority of units at the moment. Here's another mass within the liver. This is highly echogenic. Uh, this makes us suspicious that it's a benign hemangioma. We'll check back the PAX imaging to see if there's any previous liver imaging, and if it hasn't changed for years, then uh, that will be the diagnosis. But often we have to go on and confirm that with contrast imaging on CT or MR uh, in order, because, for example, some metastases can also be very bright or echogenic on ultrasound. Uh, here's uh, the aorta, very good for assessing uh, a patient who has a palpable uh, feeling or a pulsation. Often it's because they're very thin, but we can say yes or no, is there is a, not an aneurysm? And if there is an aneurysm, we can follow them up six months a year to see if that aneurysm is growing. Does it get to more than 5.5 centimeters? If so, uh, it may need surgery or um, endovascular radiological type repair. Uh, so here's your main aorta, uh, and here's thrombus within the aorta. Here's a transverse section of the aorta. Here's the thrombus within it, crescentic uh, position. Uh, and obviously, it's a matter uh, very easy just to measure the aneurysm and to do serial measurements on it. Uh, this is a friend of mine, actually, who was sent up by his GP with uh, abdominal pain, weight loss, noticed he'd gone a bit yellow around the eyes. So uh, asked to scan his uh, abdomen. Uh, and the first thing was that there's these tubes in the liver. Now, the bile ducts do accompany the portal vein in the liver, but they're normally a quarter of the caliber of the portal vein. Um, but here, they can see they're almost equal to the caliber of the portal vein. So it's easy to say, yes, he's got bile duct dilatation, so this is obstructive jaundice, as opposed to, say, cholestatic jaundice. Uh, here's his gallbladder. And although the wall looks okay, there are soft stones within the gallbladder. It's an easy matter to measure them and say, yes, he's got gallstones. Uh, if there's not bowel gas in the way, you can often look along the course of the common bile duct on ultrasound uh, in about 60% of patients. And yes, there's a stone in the common bile duct. Uh, so this is a diagnosis of... Uh, biliary obstruction due to stone in the common bile duct. Ultrasound is one of a number of imaging investigations. Uh, the endoscopists, before they do ERCP, uh, like to have an MRCP, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatogram, uh, in order to provide them with a nice road map. And here is one. You can see the common bile duct here. You can see the stone in it. Uh, this is the duodenum. This uh, particular sequence on magnetic resonance is imaging fluid. Note you've highlighted the fluid and everything else is blacked out. Uh, here's the same gallbladder of my friend with his stones in it, his dilated common bile duct, his stones in the lower common bile duct, his normal caliber pancreatic duct. Uh, here's the uh, gastroenterologist, I think Mike Mendel, uh, with his scope. Uh, and outlining the biliary tree, and he's about to dormia basket removal those stones. Uh, here's another case, patient sent up uh, from her GP with some renal symptoms, bladder symptoms. She obviously has got on her IVP uh, multiple bladder diverticular, but she's also got extrinsic compression on her pelvic haloceal system here. Now, we would say that's an extrinsic space-occupying lesion 
IVP can't get us any further. We know statistically it's likely to be a cyst, but it could be a tumour. So we send her around to the ultrasound suite and we look at the lesion that's compressing her pelvic seal system. Uh, we see that it's black, it's not sending back any echoes. Ultrasound is preeminent for assessing cysts. You can be even more confident it's a cyst on ultrasound than you can on CT and MRI if you're able to image it. Uh, and here it is, here's the posterior bright up behind the cyst because the beam is traveling straight through it. Uh, we can say categorically this is a simple cyst and not to worry. Here's a normal picture of an ultrasound of a kidney. You've got the renal sinus fat in the middle and the pelvic seal system, which isn't distended. And you've got the renal parenchyma around the outside. Uh, this is a CT uh, picture of the same kidney. Here's the cyst on the CT. Uh, here's also the cyst uh, on the MRI. Uh, here's another case uh, referred up by GP for hematuria. Uh, scanning the kidney. Here you have got a low echo mass of some sort, but it's not black like the cysts I've been showing you. It contains echoes within it. If I was to put the Doppler on, it would contain some blood flow as well. It's still pretty necrotic because it's showing bright up behind it, but nonetheless, this is not a simple cyst. This is therefore uh, would be reported as a, probably a tumor, and we'd go on to CT scanning. Uh, here's uh, the tumour in the kidney, uh, here's the tumour in the kidney on CT, and there's an incidental subcapsular cyst uh, behind it. Uh, here's another case sent up by the GP for uh, hematuria. A uh, kidney looks normal, it's not blocked, but uh, there is this high echogenistic area which is bouncing the beam, and you can see the posterior shadow behind it, in much the same way as if I stood uh, behind, uh, in front of a light source. So it's something bright which is bouncing the beam back, casting a shadow. This is the position or the appearance of an intracalocele stone. Uh, send them round for a plain film and just confirm there the stone in the lower pole of the left kidney. Well, acute abdomen. Um, in a way, ultrasound is losing ground in the acute abdomen, and that's fairly obvious. It doesn't image bowel gas and bones can get in the way. Well, if you've got distended bowel in an acute abdomen, you're not going to be able to see what's behind it, and you're not going to be able to image it directly on ultrasound. So CT has major advantages in this scenario, and we tend to go straight to CT uh, in the acute abdomen uh, now. Um, other thing is, obesity is a problem with ultrasound. It attenuates the beam, but it's an advantage for CT. It outlines the organs and provides excellent contrast. Um, not only that, you get pictures that aren't operator-dependent on CT and can be uh, reviewed at a distance. One of my colleagues, Dr. Robin Evans, you may know him, he's currently in Australia and he's working for a company, and what he does is reports the UK trauma CT overnight. Of course, it's daytime for him in Australia, and that's what he's spending his year doing. We're expecting him back in July. So with all these advantages, in the acute abdomen, CT has the major role. Ultrasound does have some advantages, however. It doesn't require ionizing radiation, uh, which is important in young people, children, and pregnant women. Uh, CT radiation doses are dropping all the time, though, uh, and some of the newer CT models have got very low radiation doses compared to what we were used to. Uh, and when you can get close to the organ, for example, the ovary with a transvaginal probe, or the kidney in a slim patient, the spatial resolution of ultrasound is in fact higher than that of a CT image, only if you can approach it closely. So here we are, here's some ovaries, and you can actually see all the little follicles around the periphery beautifully, and that's because we can approach the ovary very closely with a transvaginal probe. Uh, here's a child with ascites, uh, we can get tremendous parenchymal detail with medullary pyramids and renal sinus echoes uh, of the kidney on ultrasound. The other thing about ultrasound is it's a real-time dynamic uh, examination. You can, uh, because the refresh rate is multiple times per second, you can observe bowel movements, peristalsis, fetal movements, 
uh, blood flow, pulsations. You can get the patient to do a valsalva by, press, by getting to blow against their fist and their mouth uh, and precipitate hernias and so on. If you find anything, you've got the patient sitting beside you, so you can ask them uh, relevant questions to what you found and vice versa. You can correlate your imaging to the maximum area of tenderness or to the palpable lump that the patient or their GP has found. And as I've mentioned, these machines, you can carry them anywhere now into a GP practice or anywhere in the hospital um, with ease. Uh, here's an example of a patient lying on an ultrasound couch uh, and we're asking them to do the Valsalva maneuver. They're blowing against pressure uh, and they're managing to blow out the hernia that you wouldn't have detected if they were just lying on the CT table. Uh, but you can see the herniation of tissue through the abdominal wall defect at that point. Well, ultrasound's come a long way since it was first developed. Those of you of a historical bent, such as myself, will know that ultrasound was developed when the Titanic sank in 1912, uh, April, uh, and that's because they wanted to detect icebergs underwater. And it was great for submarines because it goes through water. No good for aeroplanes, though, because it doesn't go through air. And that's basically the principle of abdominal imaging. If you've got soft tissue, and fluid, you'll see it nicely on ultrasound, but if you're trying to image air and bone, forget it. So, going back to that first slide, we've looked at several examples of biliary imaging, of renal imaging, of vascular imaging, imaging for masses. We've considered trauma uh, and other uses, uh, ovaries, hernias, uh, of ultrasound, and that's basically what it can do for your patients in terms of diagnosis. Thank you.